Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Phil Cohen today. He's from ADAPX. It's hard to say, but a uh, wonderful uh, brand for his co company that he started about 1999. He is the VP of Research for the company. And prior to that, Phil was a professor and director of human-centered computing, right? Uh, or communication, sorry, right. at Oregon Health and... Science, Science Institute, right, it used to be called OGI before that. I've known Phil for many years. Phil was one of the pioneers of multimodal input, uh, did fantastic research looking at pen and speech input way ahead of its time. And it's very interesting now to see Phil taking all that wonderful research and actually applying it. So uh, without further ado, let's hear what he's up to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, I'll be talking about a very much of a team effort. We have about 50 people in our company. Here's just the brief facts. I'll go pretty fast past this. Um, Mary mentioned most of it. And uh, we have a great team and you'll see the results of all their hard work. Um, we've been uh, around since 1999 developing natural user interface technologies uh, starting in some government work which is actually turning into some results. and. Um, also a variety of commercial off-the-shelf offerings, some of which I'll demo to you today. So, whoops. We're interested in field, mobile, and collaborative tasks. Okay, we're basically not interested in, I wouldn't say interested, we're, we're not directed primarily at the office. We're you know, anything but the office, basically. Um, we're looking at examples of uh, people working in, uh, in environments that can be harsh, uh, outdoors in the rain. We're looking at people whose jobs really aren't meant to be computing. They're doing their other things. They're driving trucks. They're working on oil rigs. They're doing health care. Um, they have to do some computing, but that's not what they're primarily interested in. Um, harsh environments tend to corrupt your signals. So you better be prepared. That is voice. Uh, sometimes if you're driving and you're trying to, uh, in an you know, off-road vehicle, you're bouncing around a lot, your handwriting is going to suffer, um, et cetera. Um, we're looking at users who really don't want to change their work practices to suit the computing. If the computing doesn't work for their work practices, it's out of here. Um, and we're also looking at industries that require paper. Despite the Paperwork Reduction Act, you still see in many, many industries that the government is requiring a paper audit trail. Um, and that's not going away anytime soon. So when you have that, the data takes too long to come to the field. People can't make decisions quickly. I'll go through some of the examples and how long it takes some of the, uh, the data to get where it needs to go. Um, and finally, in many collaborative tasks, people find it inappropriate to be typing on computers. You know, your doctor's office is one of them. In meetings, often is another, even though, you know, we're different, right? We're geeks, but in a lot of meetings, it's considered rude to be sitting there typing. You're not paying attention to the host. So, in all these circumstances, we're finding natural user interface technologies to, is to be more acceptable. Why? Well, they tend to mimic the existing work practice. Um, I'll show you examples of that in, uh, as we go along. Uh, they can minimize training. In many cases, we've given our tools to somebody, just hand over a digital pen and they're good to go. They know what to do. Um, we'll see that uh, data collection can come in from the field much, much quicker than the current existing work practice. And, uh, and as a result, people find it uh, more efficient to, uh, to get their jobs done. Uh, we'll see that uh, the expressive power from some of what you can do in some of these technologies um, can exceed what we can do with WIMP and, uh, and often, often is uh, far more efficient. And finally, you'll see uh, collaboration, uh, how people tend to collaborate when given the choice, if they could, if we could only support it. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go. So specifically, I'll be talking about two kinds of user interface technologies. 
digital paper user interface technologies and multimodal user interfaces. And we've seen many types of users who have rejected uh, standard digital technologies. I'll give you some examples um, and discuss why it is they've done so. And uh, they do take on uh, the digital paper technologies pretty readily. And uh, we'll discuss that. Um, and if you could and, uh, and do digitize your work processes, we'll show you how that we can get that data into uh, many types of Microsoft applications. We actually plug into Microsoft applications. So um, that's something that uh, um, people find uh, very useful, that they don't have to change what they already have, and moreover, they don't have to get some new technology blessed by a corporate IT department, um, a new server, for instance. And uh, we will illustrate, in some great detail, um, multimodal user interfaces, which combine speech, sketch, handwriting, um, and uh, sometimes gesture for uh, the example I'll show you is for geospatial applications, but there are others, as you might imagine. So the strategy, at least the company strategy, has been to extend market-leading applications um, with, uh, with these kinds of technologies. So in this case, it's uh, a combination of Microsoft technologies, but also Adobe and Esri for uh, geospatial or Google, etc. Um, so we'll develop commercial off-the-shelf plugins for uh, these kinds of technologies so that you don't have to change the software that you already have. Um, and then we attempt to partner with, uh, with other larger corporations to gain, le to gain leverage. Um, so there are two types of applications I'll show you, uh, at least in the digital paper space. Uh, one which is a desktop set of applications, and that's in the lower left, where we plug into uh, Microsoft Excel into Esri's ArcGIS for mapping, into uh, Adobe Acrobat for PDF, and to OneNote, um, obviously for note-taking. And those data can come via BlackBerry or via docking, uh, for those of you familiar with the, the general Linodo platform. Uh, but we also send it for other types of applications directly into the cloud, uh, starting uh, with SharePoint. Um, and we'll uh, send the, uh, the data directly from your BlackBerry into SharePoint from the field. So that tends to be a very, uh, very highly valued uh, workflow that people are, uh, uh, are using at, at great length right now. All right. So I'm going to give you a collection of demonstrations. In some cases, I'll give you a collection of uh, videos. But uh, as we move along, if you want to see a little bit more of it, just let me know. So we have a, uh, um, a series of notebooks. This is sort of the low-end stuff. Um, this was designed for, to fit in somebody's cargo pocket. It's a field notebook. It's, got, it's on waterproof paper. And uh, if you simply write um, in the notebook and you dock your pen, as you might imagine, it goes into, uh, into OneNote. It says it's processing the ink. I've got one note open here. It's loading the pages. Um, and uh, I wrote J is here. Okay. Um, so, you know, you know all the virtues of, uh, of OneNote, but now we can do this eight. We also have this eight and a half by 11. And in fact, even uh, Microsoft branded notebooks for it's actually on your corporate site. Um, you can go out and buy this. But, well, the <coughs> excuse me, the product itself <coughs> list, which is not what Microsoft paid, but the product itself list is two ninety nine, I think, or is it three forty nine? I'm not the sales guy. Also, there's a wireless connection. No, this is I just plugged this in. There is a wireless connection, but I just plugged this in to my notebook. So you can take notes in your meetings and your document, and you have them all in one note. Okay, and uh, but you're no longer rude. And you're mobile. <laughs> All right. So that's just, you know, the taste, if you will, of, uh, you know, what can be done with OneNote. There's a whole lot more that can be done with OneNote that, you know, and I won't go into what we're doing behind the scenes, but um, this is, uh, uh, a lot of people love this. What can I say? Now. Um, the next thing we work on is uh, 
are field uh, note taking, uh, beyond note taking, rather, are forms. And I'm, uh, as you know, forms are everywhere. I'll be demonstrating this form, um, which is a, a healthcare form that I'll show you in a second. Um, this is uh, the only marketing slide I'll show you. It's got some quotes at the end. But we do this with, uh, uh, we use Excel as our design tool for all our forms packages. And in this case, um, this is the military's triage tag. Okay, if you're a wounded soldier, um, they have been um, for 50 years or so or more, you carry one of these in your pocket. And if you're wounded, the medic will take this out and fill it out. Okay. Your pocket. Yeah, that's your card. You've already pre-filled some things out, like your allergies, things like that. Okay? And then he takes it out, and he fills out what's happened to you. This is the beginning of your medical record. This is the beginning of your benefits. Okay? Now, it turns out that nearly 100% of the time, this tag never arrives with you. They clip it to your uniform. It gets blown away by the helicopter. It gets bled all over or whatever, and it disappears. So I'll tell you what's happened with that in a moment. All right, so I'm just going to fill this out. As you might imagine, somebody doing this. They've got a gunshot wound to the shoulder. Um, and then we gave him 500 units of fluid. For pain, all I have left in my bag is Tylenol. Uh, for Anna, and uh, 500 oral. His blood pressure is 90 over 60. Okay? So if I... Dock my pen. It says it's importing the page. This is our plugin to Excel. Okay, the captures plugin. It says I've got this form waiting to become waiting to come in. Written by this pen at this time. <clears throat> okay, so if I import the data. Okay, so there's me. Tylenol, 500, oral, blood pressure is 90 over 60. There's the digital ink. Oh. Every piece of paper in the Anoto... No, sorry, I, I assumed everybody was familiar with digital pens. Let me explain. Okay, so this is digital pen technology from um, which we uh, OEM from Anoto. Every piece of paper is different. It has a unique number on it. So all the pen knows is the x, y coordinates of where it is on this piece of paper and what piece of paper it is. We do all the rest. So we find the application that generated that piece of paper. We find what's written in that, I mean, what the semantics of that cell is for that piece of paper. And then we apply the appropriate semantics. In this case, the semantics of this cell was this is a text field. You can see what the data types are on the upper left. There's also a text field. This is a numeric field. And you can design whatever data types you want here. Um, handwritten ink, a checkbox, specialized terms like medical terminology, a custom expression, a regular expression, or what have you. Okay, first names, last names, postal codes. These come out of actually um, we tend to use the grammars that are already built into the handwriting tool. I'm so happy so <laughs> um, Okay, general just says we're just going to do uh, digital ink. So this is digital ink when I circled. That this fellow has a uh, wound to his shoulder. That's just digital ink. It's not recognized. <coughs> well, you can handle signatures in that way. And Many of our applications, many of our customers care about signature verification. Just that you've signed it. Think of consent forms in a hospital. Where you have Tylenol there, did you have a, an actual gram or a, a fixed word list? Yes, there is. The word list, it's called, you know, it's the lookup table, and it's one of the, uh, the ones down here. These are all the lookup tables for... Uh, yeah, okay, he's, he's just pointing, it's over there on the right, isn't it? Here's, well, these are the recognition candidates that it came up with. Oh. Turns out that's the entire word list with Jack Daniels and... 
or what have you. So whatever is in the bag, you put in the word list, okay? So you could have very large word lists. We've had many tens of thousands in a word list. Okay. Now, you, your company, created no. this? No. Anybody can do this. The whole point is this is just Excel. When you, buy, when you get the plug-in, you now can create any form you'd like, put in whatever word list you like. It dynamically populates the grammars and does the handwriting recognition based on what you, the customer, have decided to do. So we're enabling the customer to do this work. We're not in the business of, of doing this work for ourselves. So it's just a plug-in to Excel. And now you can export it. You can export it in uh, XML or put it into a relational database or what have you. So for many applications, um, this suffices. There is more this way. Yeah, uh, for many applications, they really care about the metadata. So for instance, when I click on this box, it tells me what pen wrote that, uh, this pen at this time, all the recognition candidates, you can take a look at them. Okay, but the fact that I know what pen wrote it and at which time is very important for a number of industries. Uh, think clinical trials. Having a complete audit trail of any time anybody's changed this, this is a, an eraser button over here. And on the piece of paper, if I erased this 60 and I wrote 80, and then I import it. It'll give me the result. Over here is 80, so I just changed that value. But if I look at the digital ink, it keeps the old value. You can see the old value and you can see the old ink. And we know that the fact that you've actually changed it. And that's really important for a lot of customers. Okay. Now, go ahead. How do you handle when somebody actually changes things in Excel when they're using pen? Well, then, then you're into Excel and how Excel actually can handle all the changes. That's part of, um, there's an art to making Excel actually acceptable as a, uh, for instance, for clinical trials. Yep. Now, part of the saga of this, we're in the middle of a, uh, of a study with uh, Madigan Hospital down at Fort Lewis. Um, they provided, I mean, the government, of course, is concerned about the fact that these cards get thrown away and uh, well, that the medics have taken to writing people's medical records on their forehead or on their bandages, um, which is not a particularly uh, useful uh, medical record. It doesn't get it, you know, doesn't get you uh, uh, VA benefits later on. Um, if the re medical record is gone, they might open you up again, even though they've already done it once before, et cetera. It's a really, it's not a good state of affairs. So the government provided uh, 27,000 Windows Mobile PDAs with a very nice medical record system on it. That's this image over here. And there are now 27,000 PDAs sitting in the closet because they don't work the way medics do. Right? When you have a, a casualty event, people are working very quickly from one person to another to another to another instead of finding them in the drop-down list you know, and then poking at it and then uh, using the stylus and poking, you know, etc. So it, uh, it was not nearly as fast as needed to be for, uh, for the job that they had. Um, so we're doing a study comparing, uh, again, digital paper electronic medical records for field triage um, and, uh, and the PDA. Um, so that's one area where we think that we can make some significant advantages. Uh, there are other people using this technology for uh, field medical, and I'll mention that right now. So the next, um, we use Excel also as a design tool. Yes? So if the, if the card that the patient has gets lost and someone's filling this thing out, like how do you tie this back to the specific patient? Um, the patient has filled the, card, the piece of paper out with the pen. The medic has filled the piece of paper out with a different pen. 
doesn't matter which pens, they'll all go to the same piece of paper. It'll just say this, paper, this pen wrote in this cell, this pen wrote, in, excuse me, in this other cell. If the piece of paper goes away, the data is still in the pen. As long as the wounded soldier doesn't lose his card in the first place, if it works. Right. Yeah. yeah. Once, uh, once it goes, it, you know, it's gone. But if the data is still in the pen, there are other ways to get the data where it needs to go. I was thinking more of the case where the soldier loses his card, I guess. They have spares. Well, no, but once it's been inked, the data is in the pen. Right. Every, every piece of paper is unique. Right. And so as soon as you write on a piece of paper, the pen knows which piece of paper is written. Wrote on. But now you've been two pieces. I think the issue is if the soldier lost the card after it had been filled out. Right. Or then, before. then we're okay. Yeah, if yeah. it's after it's filled out, then it's fine. If it's before that, it's been filled out, then the medic has spares. And we'll do the best they can. Yeah. <laughs> well, we hope. That's what the study intends to prove. Yes, sir. Yeah, one question. Is it possible that the, the pen or the paper can tell the user that uh, he hasn't finished the form? So we have to incomplete the form. You use the PDA, you know, something that have a validity data will tell you okay. Yeah, currently there's... the form because it's not complete yet. Yeah, currently there's no validation in the pen. We can send validation data back to some other device, like a mobile device. Uh, but right now, the pen does not have that two-way capability. Okay. So we use the Excel as a design tool um, for designing forms. And then you can publish these forms to SharePoint. So uh, what's happening right now is we're in a trial with Seattle Fire Department. This is the Seattle Fire Department medical incident report. If you fall down in the streets of Seattle, the medic will fill this form out. Okay. Right now, it, the, form, the data on this form rarely precedes you to the uh, emergency room. It would be good to get a heads up that uh, so-and-so is coming and this is the injury they've got. And then it also takes about four to six weeks for this data to get into the ambulance company system so they can bill you or for it to get into the fire department system or some other kind of emergency uh, record system if there was some other kind of incident. So um, we've, uh, we have a trial going with them so that we could see can we get this data into their back end system uh, the moment they've written it. So I'll just again fill out uh, this form with some of my demographics. I've had a cardiac arrest. Um, I was found by a bystander. I'm in shock. Uh, yes, the collapse was heard. Um, I'm responsive to, uh, to voice, but I'm confused, as usual. Um, uh, my respiration is greater than 29 a minute. You know, I've got uh, blood pressure, again, of 90 over 60, and a heart rate of 75. Okay, but instead of sending that data via docking, I'm going to actually send it by my BlackBerry. Okay, so the BlackBerry is asked, we accept the connection from this pen, we can take that off. Um, no, the BlackBerry is just transmitting it. There's a little piece, there's a little Bluetooth from the pen to the BlackBerry, and the BlackBerry is now upload, received, receiving the data from the pen, and it's going to upload it to the SharePoint server. And I'm connected to the SharePoint server with my little, uh, um, wireless my fight capability okay so it's starting the upload I will uh, go to the SharePoint list um, and uh, when it tells me it's done the upload is complete I'll refresh the page Okay, so let's see what it said. So it uses Silverlight in the, uh, to do the, the display of the form itself. The data is stored in the SharePoint lists and then is regenerated on the, as you see it. Okay, so here's what I wrote. Um, I said I was sick. Um, my demographics, 90 over 75, 90 over 60, heart rate 75. That's the ink. There's the text. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, 
Okay, and you can see a shadow of the, the ink in the background. Okay, his blood pressure 90 over 60, his heart rate 75, where uh, I'm confused somewhere in here. Um, the collapse was heard. Okay, you get the idea. There's my confusion. And uh, you can see, you know, the date and time for every, uh, every stroke that was written. And this data, again, is sent from the field directly to a SharePoint server, and it kicks off a workflow. You know, hopefully, it'll, um, it'll automatically get sent to the appropriate hospital. In here, one of these, form, uh, one of these uh, uh, fields is the code for the hospital in Seattle where you're being taken. So it will automatically send uh, an email with uh, an image of this form to the hospital. So it'll take a PDF of it and ship it. All right, and um, we also do this with not merely um, uh, SharePoint, but we're also doing this with your Dynamics program for uh, CRM, using SharePoint again as the, the intermediate stage, um, and the ink is sent to a SharePoint server, and then from the server it's imported directly into the CRM systems. So again, as an example of uh, people, sales agents, um, take a lot of notes, and it's always difficult to get them to fill in the, the CRM system. Um, and being able to, uh, to actually do, take the notes and populate the CRM system at the same time is something that uh, people are finding, at least corporations are finding, uh, to be very useful. All right. Other folks are using this. Holland America Cruise Lines downtown. Um, their medical department is digitized using this uh, technology now. They had a problem that, of course, you had to, uh, they would scan all the forms. Remember, it's a little city for, two or th for a week or two, 3,000 people in it, and there are a lot of medical forms. And they would scan all those forms and then ship it by satellite to, uh, um, to the lo local uh, back office over here. And, they, you know, and it was scanned, and they couldn't find uh, the data that they needed to. Um, so now they're filling it out and just shipping the digital ink. We saved them from two lawsuits out here. Uh, Finning Canada does vehicle inspections at the Alberta Tar Sands. They, you know, run those vehicles whose tires are bigger than your house. All right. when, those, when those vehicles are down, uh, they lose money. Uh, Merck has been doing it for animal studies. Pepco is a big utility in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and now we've got a pilot going with Atlantic City for utility inspections. I've shown you Seattle Fire. U.S. Courts in San Antonio are doing this for pretrial and probation. Um, they also asked us for a little 911 call. So one of those boxes is actually a 911. So if the, the, your client, your, your probation officer and your client, you know, the one with the ankle bracelet has a, is threatening in some way, you tick this little box and it sends a note to the back office and the Texas Rangers appear on your doorstep, in part because we also send the GPS coordinates of the device. Okay, so they appreciated that. Ah, all right, so next, I've shown you forms, both desktop and server. Um, we're also interested in other types of um, topics, such as uh, mapping. So the, uh, the number one mapping system out there right now is called ArcGIS. I don't know if any of you are familiar with, uh, with mapping systems, but this is used by state and local governments. It's used by the federal government, um, utilities, you name it. Um, so what we've done is we've digitized um, all these maps via a plugin. And first I'll start this one. Remember, our strategy is to plug into leading applications. So what we find is people will often go out into the field, and, uh, and they're usually equipped with a paper map. They may have a computer, but the paper maps actually are a lot more convenient for many of the applications and many of the users we're dealing with. Um, so this is a, uh, 
a map of, for firefighting, you know, wildland firefighting. And in um, Esri uh, terminology, this is your legend. Okay? I have one copy here. I'll keep one copy and I'll pass around one copy. So this legend, as you've seen on many maps, tells you what the symbols mean. And for a firefighter who's planning in the field, how are we going to, uh, to fight this fire, they will often mark up their maps to indicate what they want to do. So for instance, I'm going to put down a uh, incident command post and I'll put it over here near Sunnybank. And I'm going to put a heli base nearby. Um, and uh, a medevac station on the other side. And then uh, we know that there are fires located uh, in the hills in various places. Um, and there's an uncontrolled fire edge which goes between them. And now I'm going to start fighting the fire. I'm going to start to putting some uh, aerial foam in a certain location. Um, I want aerial water drops here and here. So what am I doing? I'm ticking the legend entries and then marking them on the map. So we've made this legend into a user interface. So now when I dock the pen, it says it's importing the data now into ArcGIS because it knows where this data came from. And here are our little plug-in buttons they can move around which indicate I have a session waiting for this map and that's everything I just did. Remember I said I've got an instant command post, I'm going to put a helibase, I'm going to put a medevac site, uh, I've got some fire br uh, burning here and here, this is the uncontrolled fire edge and I'm putting an aerial foam drop around here. Okay, so these are now elements of the geospatial database. Yes, sir. Does your, does your paper copy now actually look anything like this? No, well, it does look something like this, and if you want your paper copy to look like this, you can write symbols on it that look, that remind you of what it was. So for the fire, I wrote it F. For the aerial, uh, uh, for the instant command post, I wrote it I. For the helibase, I wrote it H. For the M, I wrote the medevac site. But no, it doesn't, I don't see these symbols here. I see something that reminds me what you they were. in your studies that, that that's the correspondence between the two, the two is important for folks? We have not heard that it's not important yet. Okay. So we haven't heard one way or another. Okay. Um, but we have heard that they're happy enough with it that they won't go to a fire without it. This is Santa Barbara County Fire. All right, and these, by the way, as you can see from that list, there can be a long list of um, things that they might be doing. These are the line objects, or the point, these are the point objects, rather. Now, those are the line objects. Here are the point objects. Safety zones, ign aerial ignitions, helibases, heat sources, mud pits, medevac sites, okay? Yeah. Do you have any way on the pen of, <coughs> of indicating state? Because like, it seems like one issue here is that you might tick off like a you know, fire line or whatever and if you're talking with other people and you get interrupted, you forget which thing the pen is set to. Essentially. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have that opportunity in this, in this pen. So you can always go back. If you forgot, you can always go back and tick it again. If you don't remember what, you know, the last one, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt you to go back and do it again. Right. Yeah, I guess probably if you think you remember, but you don't. <laughs> okay. Um, often what happens is these get sent to a back office and they are in an edit stage where somebody then will decide whether to keep them or not. So, for instance, you can go through um, one by one. I'm going through one by one with these little uh, buttons over here for each of these and you can decide to keep it or, uh, or delete it. A lot of uh, organizations have somebody in the back office who is verifying these map updates. They don't just let anybody update uh, the map per se. 
All right, I'll come back to this. Um, so that's ArcGIS, and it's a plug-in. Now it turns out ArcGIS is a pretty heavyweight system, and a lot of people get very uh, confused on how to use this thing. Um, so what we've developed is a uh, GIS Lite version that works with GeoPDF. Are you familiar with GeoPDF? Um, so built into Adobe now through a company called Terago is the ability to print a map with geo coordinates built into it. So when I write on this map, um, this map was for uh, management of the oil spill, and, um, and I write here, uh, I wrote dead manatees on it. Now it automatically loads PDF. And it turns out that if you go to the USGS site, every topographical map from the US Geological Survey now is GOP is geo enabled through GeoPDF. Okay, so it's now finding the it's now actually finding the appropriate file. And I wrote dead manatees on it. There were other things I had written on this before. Okay? So this is Adobe Reader. Turns out this is the Terago plugin, which is here, is free. They charge in the standard Adobe model for publishing the maps, not for reading them. But we've added the data into the map, and now I can export it. And I'll export this as manatees. I better have a, uh, I already had one. And then if I go open that file, and I double click on it. It takes me to just where I, where I just was. Okay, so I went from people collecting data in the field with just a piece of paper and a pen. You can send that data in by your Blackberry. Somebody in the command center can now see what you wrote in Google Earth. Okay, so this is also a, a very useful technology and you can deputize people to be data collectors. They already know how to write on a piece of paper. Uh, turns out that the user interface for both of these are fairly simple. With the ArcGIS, we've had students uh, doing uh, Earth Day um, activities in Nashua, New Hampshire, trying to write down where the garbage is to have the garbage trucks come by and pick it up. Um, we've had uh, people in uh, third world countries working on land use disputes in East Timor. Um, let's go back to the talk. Um, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture is using this stuff for uh, uh, crop inspections. The Port of Seattle is doing this now in SeaTac Airport to indicate where all the defibrillators are. It's a good place to have a heart attack. They know where the, defib def the defibrillators are within uh, one or two feet. Um, National Geospatial Ag uh, Intelligence Agency for disaster response, for pipeline inspections, for I showed you wildland firefighting, and now it's in Afghanistan helping Kandahari's uh, build water treatment facilities. Okay, it's a very easy to use user interface. Um, now, we are engaged in a, in a study um, sponsored by the Army Corps to figure out how to add attributes. What I created was those, the features themselves, but each of those features has attributes. If you're looking at manholes, there's the ID number, the diameter, the condition, the composition. Every one of those is in that geospatial is in the geo database for this um, uh, for this application. 
and you need to be able to update that data too. And it's tricky to do that with uh, ArcGIS as a, itself. Um, so what we've done is we've combined it with the Excel product so that I can fill out a form for each of the attributes and when I dock the pen, the form will go into Excel and then I can import that back into uh, ArcGIS. That's one way to do it. So we're looking at three separate ways to do it. Write the attribute value data on the map and with some uh, attribute equals value, for example. Write it in a form and in, uh, write a little linking ID. This is number one and here's the form entry for number one. This is number three. Here's the form entry for number three. Or simply use temporal information that is the, the form entry that is closest in time to the time when I wrote that feature will be the one that gets fused together. And uh, we have about three more days uh, of this study to figure out which is uh, for the data collection downtown and then uh, next time we see each other I can report which is the right way to do this. And it could be, end up being a combination of the above. You need to do just one of these methods. All right. Just a little uh, historical information. People keep asking, well, can you have any kind of feedback with this device? Long ago and far away, we built an itty bitty book light with a, with a little laser projector. Um, whoops. And uh, that was, it was cute. Um, you can see it there in the corner. It, uh, it did what it needed to. So this is streaming paper and when I wrote symbols on this paper it would recognize what they were. Uh, in fact, I could speak and draw and I'll show you some of that later. Um, but you had to have a dark room. It was a, the very earliest little laser projectors. Okay. It, was, it tied into what uh, David McGee was doing for his PhD thesis as well. Um, but it was not, uh, you know, it's not very functional and uh, to this date even the current projectors even, uh, are not uh, as useful as you might imagine for this kind of a task. We also worked with, um, here I'm not even going to bother with the, with the sound for this one. Um, we work with, well I guess I am. <laughs> we work with uh, AR Toolworks to do uh, augmented reality on top of the paper. So you would sketch that represents the controlled airspace over an airport. As the camera moves around the map, objects remain in their fixed location. You would sketch something and it would create the object and you'd see it hovering over the map. Dead eyes interprets them and places an appropriate object on the map. We can visualize relative 3D placement of these objects by drawing the course that a helicopter would fly on its mission. And then when you zoomed in you could zoom into the map and the markers the are map, gone. And the fiducial markers move out of the camera's field of view. Natural feature tracking enables the objects to stay properly positioned. We use the map itself user can as the fiducial. A drawing on an identical map and his objects are added to the NetEye system for all to see. And it's collaborative. The remote user is able Okay. Um, so that was another experiment in how you might do uh, um, feedback given you're writing on a piece of paper. Okay, so that's digital paper user interfaces and you can see we've got a number of products that are uh, in uh, a variety of stages and quite a number of customers and we think this has some legs. Next we want to move on to uh, multimodal interaction. That's the ability to use one or more of your natural interface modalities one of which could be the digital paper. In fact, we have done digital multimodal paper. Um, that's actually our, the first application we did at ADAPTS. But, hmm? What do you mean by multimodal paper? Speaking and drawing on a piece of paper. Um, and uh, in this case, we're, we'll probably, well, I will be demonstrating voice, sketch, handwriting. Uh, I won't be doing touch and gestures, but I've got some videos to that effect later on. So when you combine them, of course, is when we talk about multimodal. And now why bother with this? Well, for a variety of different applications, you have different reasons to do so. In many applications, we've seen it far faster 
than, uh, than a standard GUI. In some applications, we've seen it over 16 times faster for a government-oriented GUI. Um, the, uh, we've seen significant user preference uh, over GUI over many years. Um, uh, Sharon Oviatt's results on uh, cognitive load. Um, the more the task increases, the more people actually get multimodal when given the opportunity to use these modes. They'll use them in combination, the harder the task. Um, robustness versus uh, using a single mode alone. Um, we often do studies of uh, error rate reductions and have found typically for voice and sketch 15 to 30 percent relative error rate reductions. And when we throw in three modes in a multimodal virtual reality system we did way back when with Columbia, we got uh, on the order of 67 percent relative error rate reductions. So. Uh, we see uh, utility when, uh, uh, when you're in the field, when any of your modes might be corrupted by voice, by uh, noise, by uh, vibration, etc. Uh, foreign accents. Um, and of course, some modes are uh, better able to express information than others. Uh, it's hard to express locative information just by voice. Uh, nine digit Greek coordinates are not particularly, uh, you know, you need two of them to do anything and if you're trying to draw a line that way, it's very difficult. Um, and give people a choice and uh, they know when, uh, when to use it. So, um, the history, obviously you're all familiar with put that there. Um, the system we built way back when, when Jay Pittman was there, was called Quickset. Um, and uh, that went on for about a decade. And now we have a new system that's built into a bigger system called Deep Green. Uh, our system uh, has got a, I'll show you the name a little bit later on. Um, and uh, it's get, it has some legs right now. It's going to be, uh, it likely will be deployed. So, um, let me give you a demonstration. Um, but to do that, I've got to kill this Esri system. It's called, well it'll tell you what it's called here in a second. Um, it's called CM2C2 captures multimodal for command and control. Um, And the idea here is a, uh, for people who are doing planning applications, as might be going on uh, right now, um, you have the ability to speak and draw and create um, objects on the display. So for instance, main supply route. Okay, so these are standard technologies, I mean standard terminology rather, people are used to, uh, to seeing this, suspected IED explosion. And people who are driving vehicles have to keep track of all this stuff. Um, but we also, in addition to, the, to uh, voice and sketch, so uh, I can do assembly area. And this uses MSR speech recognition, but using our sketch recognition. So for instance, if it gets that, I'll be, these things wobble. So I missed one of the strokes, it got it anyway. Okay, that's a helicopter. There's your end best list. Okay, so if I got it wrong, and it really was a friendly fossil fuel electric power facility, um, you can select what it was. Okay. So you get the basic idea. And there are thousands of symbols, and this system has a vocabulary of about four, five, four now about 5,000 symbols, and you can either speak them and dr do a speech and, uh, and sketch, follow and support and it'll create the right kind of symbol for that. Or um, it, uh, you can do a, uh, you could just sketch it. Yes, Ken? How are you um, queuing it there to listen to your speech while you're queuing? Is it good the speech is always on right now. <clears throat> <clears throat> the speech is on the whole time. 
it just knows, since this is a multimodal system, to either, you know, to wait till I'm sketching to do anything. So either, either it's touching the screen and I'm drawing something, <coughs> and if the speech doesn't work, it throws it away. When the pen goes down, there's a window of time that, that it's looking for the, the voice. <coughs> Sorry. Now, this is purpose-built for that particular purpose. And the way we're commercializing that is to, um, and by the way, that, as I said, it looks like that will be deployed. Um, in, uh, in vehicles. And the way we're commercializing that is to, uh, to build a system to automatically generate such a system. So this is the, uh, the fire system that I showed you before. Except now Oops, I didn't kill everything. So I'm going to start this over again. That's why. So you talked a little bit about the different modalities allowing for sort of redundancy. So mm -hmm. if I write a thing that looks like it might be AA or maybe AB, but I wrote, but, but we heard assembly area. Do right. you take both of those as inputs to we do. score the, the two directions? We do, and we fuse them. Usually we start at the semantic level and then have a statistical process in the background that uh, uh, attempts to make sense out of what, how those two modalities could come together. Do you capture the voice data also? So for the subsequent, like if you've got somebody doing the, like in the same way that you captured the ink yep. earlier, where I can say, oh, it looked like they wrote 90 over 60, but that number doesn't make any sense here. Can you play the audio for what they said? We do have that. Okay. okay. So now I've just, uh, by hitting this button over here, I've just snarped up the, uh, the speech vocabulary, the, uh, the table of contents effectively. Okay, which is point line area table of contents, and now I can uh, um, draw the escape route. Okay, you get the idea. Aerial foam drop. So this is automatically built. I didn't have, if I put in a different map and I snarf up the vocabulary, I get different vocabulary. So I don't have to purpose build this system any longer. Um, and that's, uh, so now, now it's the equivalent of an automatic uh, put that there system based on the map that you actually give it. Okay. So that will be, um, that's something that's near and dear to my heart and hopefully we'll have uh, uh, more to say about that as we go along. Um, let me, uh, there's more demos to be had, but I think we're coming to the end for those who want to, uh, to exit. Um, as I said, we're plugged in, so there's another plug into ArcGIS. We can plug it into other mapping systems. That's not the, um, problematic uh, as long as you actually have, uh, you know, digital objects, unlike uh, our GeoPDF doesn't have any. Um, and so we automatically create a multimodal system for any mapping system. We've worked with uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. I won't go into that. Um, and, uh, but suffice it to say, the, the multimodal uh, capabilities work uh, with arm gestures and body tracking, which we've done over the years with uh, MIT and Trevor, Trevor Darrell's group. Um, so uh, given uh, the kind of stuff you all are working on right now, the multimodal capabilities would, uh, would plug into the, that kind of thing directly. Um, so I have, there was one slide that I was 
interested in showing you. Um, many of you may not have seen this, but given the surface work that you have going on, I thought you might find interesting um, how people do multi-touch in the wild, how they really do it. So this was a National Guard exercise in around 2000, and, around the year 2000, and I was able to get a camera in on a, over a light shining down on a paper map as multiple people are standing around this paper map trying to defend Korea in a simulated exercise. This is All right, so that's just one guy with multiple gestures in the middle of his utterance. We often we found anywhere from two to seven gestures in the middle of an utterance, depending on how many hands he's using at the time. Okay, so you need to be uh, um, cognizant of the fact that that's gonna happen very, very fluidly. Here's, there are 50, the reason it's noisy is there are 50 people around the room, all right? But the four main guys are right here focused on this map. Um, the next one I'll show you is a collaborative example of doing exact, uh, of the same thing, um, and realize that Gestures are being used in multiple ways. And we can talk about that if you want later on. All right. Four people. One guy's using the other guy's hand as a prop. He made it into a hill as he went around. He's going around this way. You want to see that again? And language takes to, tends to change what gestures mean. So there's one guy who puts his finger on the map for about five minutes, which is the equivalent of raising your hand. Okay? And then he says, who reported this? He hasn't moved his finger. Okay? So he, the language changed it to, to a pointing, you know, first it's a call for attention, reminding himself what to do, and then the language changed what it meant. There's a lot more data here I'd be happy to share on... Uh, uh, on how people really use this stuff. All right. So just to finish up, I think there are large enterprise and federal markets which are amenable to natural user interface technologies, especially if they're in the field. Um, and what we've shown you today is actually built on Microsoft technologies, the, the handwriting, the, the speech, and obviously the, uh, the core back-end applications. Um, multimodal is beginning to find its niche. I think uh, it has still a ways to go, but we actually have applications now that can be populated by, um, by the data source themselves. You don't have to build it from scratch, the tools themselves actually function uh, on their own. Um, so the question I have for you all is, how do we uh, work more closely together? Okay. Yeah. I'll ask one. Sure. Um, you mentioned, or showed some of the demos with speech and uh, and the styles. Mm -hmm. Interested in other combinations as well, uh, which ones that you find interesting for your customers. So maybe the stylus of touch or speech touch or touch mouse, is a, those other devices. Touch is, a, is something people want to do. The reason for the stylus, of course, is precision. For, for anything geospatial, your finger is not anywhere near close enough. I want a stylus because I want to be able to write. The, uh, um, the, the iPad notwithstanding, I still like writing. Um, and um, gestures are, um, 
for some of the dismount, you know, for the applications in the field, you know, gesture sensing is very tricky. Uh, where Benko's gone already, but he can certainly fill you in on how hard that is. Um, we find uh, voice is something people often want to do, but not always, depending on the circumstances. So that's why you see uh, the, uh, the ability in some of these applications just to sketch alone. So the ability to do any of them alone and to combine them is the kind of architectures we like building. I, I wonder about, you know, when you ticked off the, uh, uh, the helipad and the things for, the, for GIS, mm -hmm. uh, for the firefighting, you know, point finger on one of those objects and then line around, you know, indicating that you're, because in, in situations where voice maybe isn't practical because it's a, a the, You're thinking with a tablet itself. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious if those, if those other kinds of combinations. In the field, these guys are wearing gloves. So if I'm in the field doing that versus a command center doing that, if I'm in the field, a single, uh, I would expect they're not going to do that. In some cases, they're holding on to the truck. Um, but, you know, hold something and draw. Yeah, you could imagine some two-handed applications. I haven't seen anybody say, gee, I really wish I could do that. Um, but the ability to touch, multi-touch, I'm not sure for that application, how, how useful that would be. <coughs> Other questions? I, I, um, yep. When your developers were actually making these applications, were there times where people were losing their temper and cussing at the um, Microsoft recognition? Oh, well, that's why I was going to discuss with you privately. <laughs> <laughs> It's a question that comes to my mind often. <laughs> yes, we can talk about recognition. Um, we do uh, find it better to have forms with more checkboxes than text entry fields. Um, we do have to compete in the sense of a lot of these organizations have a back-end office who's dedicated to typing in forms. They get forms from their customers. For instance, a police department we work with where they're filling out gang forms, you know, where they're interviewing gang members. And those forms go into the back room and people are sitting there typing in nonstop these forms to get them into the database. So um, w the return on investment for them is, uh, is how much time can I save those folks in the back room? Of course, unfortunately, they might be thinking maybe I'll lay one of them off or two of them or whatever, which is a bad thing because then uh, people will say, well, I'm just going to slow down. Um, with your new technology, right? That's typical. You know, if they think it's going to affect their, uh, their livelihood. But the idea of how much can I uh, save in the retyping is not where we want to be uh, gaining a return on investment. That's where that customer was hoping to find one. Um, and if we had had a better handwriting recognition, um, we probably would have kept that customer. And I could tell you about that later on. It's not, you know, not every one of these projects is a win, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't win. But that's not because we're competing against another technology, they're still going to use paper and retype it. So you're competing against the actual typing on yep. paper and, the, and the, probably the labor. Yes, the unions get into this in interesting ways. And I'd be happy to talk about that over lunch too. <laughs> <laughs> And FYI, here's a fun app.